All right, well, welcome to our live session uh, on historical sources in writing or how to pass a paper assignment in a history class. As you get going on your papers for the second half of the term, I wanted you to take a few, I to take a few moments to offer some advice that I hope will help you succeed. Writing and sourcing requirements in a class like this can be a little unique. And now is the time to go over it uh, so that you can be in the best position to do well. So what makes good history? You have to have some kind of idea of the target that you're aiming for if you hope to hit it. Well, much of what history assignments require have to do with what history itself is and what distinguishes good history from bad history. The overall key point to remember is that history is completely dependent upon the idea of truth in order for it to mean anything. So what's the difference between my book on Robert E. Lee and someone else's story about him that they made up in their own heads? Well, of course, the answer is that mine is based on research and into the available evidence, so that when you read my book, theoretically, you're going to be getting something that you have reason to believe is true, that you can say actually happened. In short, you can trust it as opposed to something that's just made up. So as a result, history is only as good as the evidence supporting it. Your evidence and your sources are the foundations upon which you build. You can have the greatest pro style in the world, lots of pretty pictures, and even be a talking head in documentaries, but if you don't have the evidence to support you and show that what you're saying is true, all your time is wasted. Therefore, history classes must be a place uh, where we place a premium on using good evidence. And in order to do that, we need to talk about what that kind of evidence is and how to handle it. Well, broadly speaking, there are two types of evidence that historians deal with. There are primary sources and secondary sources. Primary sources are those that come directly from an eyewitness to or a participant in an event. Let me emphasize that again. Primary sources come from eyewitnesses or direct participants. A primary source is not uh, simply a source that is directly about something, like uh, a lot of people seem to think. It has to be from someone who was there, someone who can actually speak directly to it. So for example, a letter from a soldier who fought in the Battle of Antietam describing what he saw would be considered a primary source. A newspaper account from someone who was not there, but they're writing about what they heard from someone else, that is not a primary source. A history book the, about the Battle of Antietam is not in itself a primary source. Primary sources are the meat of the historical trade. When a historian sits down to write history, these are the basic building blocks that you use. And so if you want your history to be profoundly original, if you want it to say something new, it has to be based on primary sources. Secondary sources are those that come from people who did not directly participate in an event, but are basing their descriptions on some other evidence. Now, the most common form of secondary source that you are probably familiar with is your average history book. Consider the textbooks in your class. Did the authors see anything that they actually are talking about? No, they, they, they weren't born usually for many years until after this had occurred. So why do they think they know what went on? They believe they know, that they know what went on because they've gone out and read hundreds of first-hand accounts. And they've read other historians who've also done work. And they've gotten out and maybe walked the fields. They've seen where things happened. And they're now presenting the, reason, uh, the reasoned result to you in the form of a secondary source. Now, good history, well done history, is going to involve both kinds of sources. Use at the proper time and in the proper way. Primary sources, they get you straight to the original source, but the problem is with many of them, they're very, 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 very short and very, very specific, and they always come from just a single point of view. So having just one primary source is simply not going to be good enough uh, for your uh, uh, for, for a major paper. Uh, so when you deal with primary sources, you have to go back and you have to bring in as many as you possibly can. Uh, you know, for you 401 students, uh, 
you're going to be limited by the amount of time that you have. Uh, so you have to do the best that you can. But if you're writing a major thesis or a major book, you might be dealing with hundreds of primary sources because each one contains a little bit of the truth. Each one contains a little perspective. And you're going to try to get as many perspectives as you can and balance them all out against each other. But the, obviously, the advantage of primary sources is that they come from eyewitnesses. They come from people who were actually there. You don't have to take someone else's word for it. This is someone who saw it. Secondary sources are really good at boiling down information. You can sit down and you can read a secondary source, and you can access the result of hundreds, maybe even thousands of, of, of man hours of research, and you can do it in just, a few, in just a few hours or a few days. Some of the books that you might read uh, in terms of secondary sources might represent literal years, decades of an author's life spent reviewing thousands of sources that would have taken you equal decades to try to review. But in a, with, with a secondary source, you can sit down and it's all boiled down into an hourglass for you. Uh, and you can, you can take that, those results and run with them. Um, now, of course, the problem with secondary sources, again, is that they're from a, per, a certain person's perspective. And they're not from the perspective, usually, of an eyewitness. That would make them a primary source. And so you also have to be very, very careful uh, about secondary sources. Don't take them by themselves. But each one used in its proper way is extremely important to producing a very strong uh, thesis or paper. Now, the second kind of evidence I wanted to talk about tonight uh, is uh, the distinction between popular and scholarly. Popular sources are those that are written primarily to entertain or they're aimed at non-scholars. These tend to be overly simplistic, and they can often omit very important details. Uh, you know, perhaps the author doesn't want to distract you from his or her main point, or they think the story would be more interesting without these particular little details. So they feel like they're going to leave them out. Well, the point of a popular source is usually not to provide you with the absolute, complete, and total truth. Popular sources have other goals. Uh, you can think about probably the most well-known uh, source of popular sources, the History Channel. The History Channel is not there in its documentaries to give you every single detail and excruciating precision. It's there to keep you entertained until the next set of commercials come on. And if you're just looking to unwind at the end of a long day, well, that kind of source is not a bad thing. On the other hand, if you are a scholar uh, or if you are a historian, a professional historian uh, working on uh, an original thesis, probably they're not going to be what you want to use. Uh, so hopefully you can see the, why you would not really want to use something like that, especially in a major thesis. Now, scholarly sources are written by scholars to scholars. They've been reviewed, they are, uh, and they are primarily concerned with telling the complete truth and basing everything they possibly can uh, on evidence uh, and proof. Uh, this is great if you're after the complete truth. So you know, as a scholar going out to try to dig out all of the great details uh, that you're going, to, you're going to use when you make your argument, it's wonderful. At the same time, you can see how, some, how someone else who just maybe enjoys history and isn't trying to do it for a living or isn't trying to get a degree in it, how they might get annoyed about getting bogged down in the specifics of a 700-page book with thousands of footnotes to sources uh, and people that they really don't really care about. Uh, you know, they want to sit down and they want to read a good story or they want to see a good story. They don't. They, 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 and I'm sure you know this, the books that I'm talking about here that have like more footnotes on the page than they actually have text. Uh, that's not the kind of thing most people uh, read for read for fun. Um, so you can see where scholarly sources are suited more toward the scholars and obviously popular sources to others. So at the college level and above, you really want to use those scholarly sources uh, and intelligently leverage both primary and secondary evidence. Uh, and especially if you're working on your senior thesis and you're thinking about this maybe as a possible grad school application paper, you think about it as possible uh, 
publication material, you definitely don't want to have those scholar those those non scholarly sources, those popular sources, popping up when you could replace them with something much much more uh, much much more uh, much stronger. Well. It's one thing to say that you should use scholarly sources, but how do you actually tell the difference? Where do you go to try to identify the, uh, the, the scholarly sources? Uh, well, there's a very easy way to do it, um, and that is stick to what you can find uh, on the website of a college or university library. Uh, that, that, that's the, uh, the easiest way, because colleges and universities have paid librarians who work full time who are there to make sure that what they offer to you in their libraries is worth your time. And so uh, and even if even if you can't find what you're looking for uh, in, in, in our university library, many universities make make many sources available uh, to the public. And so you can probably for most average paper projects go to one of these websites if not one more than one, but certainly, uh, uh, certainly in our university, you can find more than enough sources uh, to accomplish what you're what you're aiming to do. Uh, but what if you're going to step beyond that? What if you're going to just to insist on doing that uh, that the the, prover the proverbial Google search and just see what comes up? Uh, well, one of the very first things I would say is that if you're going to do a Google search, do not just Google it. Uh, Google itself, uh, you probably know, uh, brings you sources not based on their actual applicability to your search. They bring you those sources based on who's paid the most to have their website show up when your particular AdWords are searched. Uh, so resist the temptation. Uh, instead, look at scholar.google.com. And there are several other sites out there like that. Uh, Scholar.google.com automatically filters out a lot of the junk for you and points you to these, in theory, more reliable sources. But if you're gonna, in any of these cases, you're going to want a more sophisticated approach. And so there are several things, several questions that you can ask. Uh, first, ask who the author is. What are his or her qualifications? If the author is a professional historian uh, or a writer with degrees and a strong publication history, you're probably in good shape there. Now, on the other hand, if it's Joe Blow, who's an accountant running a side website on Thomas Jefferson for kicks, wish him the best, hope he has a great readership, but he's probably not somebody you're going to want to quote from uh, in, your, in your thesis. Now, of course, doesn't mean that what you might see there might not be useful, uh, but I would suggest that instead of quoting from him, you go and research it further and find his original sources, hopefully, and uh, use them. Second, ask, is it researched and documented using reputable sources? So if you see plenty of footnotes or bibliographic references to primary sources, well and good. If it's a book that is nothing but straight narrative, or one that, uh, that relies on only a few scholarly sources, you should probably think about avoiding it. A third question, this is one a lot of people don't think about, but ask, who is the publisher? Uh, look for professional or university presses, uh, because those come with strong scholarly review processes. Uh, if, if it's a professional peer-reviewed publisher, any time someone publishes a book through there, it's, it's already been reviewed by multiple scholars, and those scholars are going to make sure that what you're dealing with here, what you're seeing coming out into this university's name, uh, is worthwhile. On the other hand, uh, some publishers should be uh, excluded immediately. So if you see uh, Tor, which publishes fantasy, or Viking children's books, another one, uh, that uh, a lot of people I see make the mistake of including are books by Scholastic. Scholastic sounds nice and scholarly, right? Uh, until you realize that they make books for middle schoolers and high schoolers. So generally, you know, not that their information is bad, but it's not the kind of source you want to pre you want to present as your very strong uh, as a very strong basis for your uh, uh, for your work. 
Uh, also, anything from an unknown publisher or a self-publisher. Uh, some examples there are Ex Libris, Create Space, or Lulu. Uh, there are several others out there. Those, generally, you should look at very, very carefully before using it. Uh, I, I do. I will say I do know of some historians uh, and, and other scholars who have used those sources before uh, to self-publish something that uh, is especially controversial, or maybe they don't want. Maybe maybe they want to make seventy percent royalties on their books instead of five percent, like if they go with a uh, uh, a more traditional press. Uh, you know, my my first book came out with the University of Missouri, and I have made about enough money to take my family out to eat at McDonald's uh, over the course of the years. Now, if it's just me and my wife, we might be able to afford uh, something a little bit better, maybe Shoney's, if you remember that. Uh, but the idea is that you don't make much money with scholarly publications. So some, pe some worthwhile authors might consider something a little bit different, but you should look at that very, very, very carefully because it's going to raise those red flags that we talked about in our previous, our previous lecture. Um, anyway, fourth, uh, ask who's the audience. If the book is aimed at historians or other scholars, it should be scholarly. Uh, if, uh, at the same time, if it's aimed at a popular audience, it would probably be simplistic and lack the detail and nuance that you're looking for. Now, bear in mind that that's not a checklist I just gave you. Uh, it is, uh, again, a tool set. And you can use these questions to, to ask, uh, to come to some, in some intelligent, informed conclusions. But there may be cases where a book uh, or an article or some other source fits one or two of these, but not the others, and you may still decide to use it. But if you ask these questions, I found that uh, generally you'll have enough information uh, that, uh, that you'll be able to get on with. Also, sometimes uh, a source might fulfill all but one of the indicators, and you should avoid it. Uh, a book, for example, by a discredited individual who's been proven to misuse uh, evidence. Uh, sometimes that, occur that occurs. It may actually be. Uh, uh, it may actually say yes to all of these, and you find that out and still uh, decide not to use it. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's at least something to get started with. Now, one of the things that especially, uh, for those of you in 401, uh, if you have not heard this, this spiel before, it will, it will be, this, this here will be worth your, uh, worth the price of admission, uh, because you're getting to the level where, quite frankly, you're going to probably be wanting to ask yourself, are these people crazy? Do they think I can actually read all of these books and all of these sources that I'm supposed to read uh, for this class, for this paper, for whatever project you're working on? Uh, and that is honestly a completely normal wall to hit. You usually hit it right about your senior year. And if you haven't hit it now, if you go to graduate school, you definitely will. Uh, you know, I, I can give you an example of my graduate school experience. Uh, we had usually one readings course and two seminars. And for each one of those, we might be expected to go through anywhere from 20 to 40 books plus articles over the course of a single 16-week semester. And of course, that's not total. That's per class. Uh, and so you look at that, and you're like, if I read a book a day, how do I do that? It's not possible. Well, the truth is, it's not possible. Uh, and that, but that should not discourage you, because there are ways to deal with it. And, the gut, and this process of book gutting uh, is, is how you do it. So what you need to be able to do is assimilate a broad range of information very quickly and efficiently. And what you're doing uh, is essentially becoming a kind of data miner. Uh, instead of having to sit down and read the entire book word for word in order to get what you need, you find out, you, you ask the question that you have of the book. You see what, the, what, it, what, is, what it is there before you. And then you go very targetedly, very specifically to the parts of the book that have the information you need. You get it, and you get out. Uh, you do that, and you can actually manage to, uh, to to finish a book in a few hours or a few days, sometimes even 10 minutes. Um, 
I've actually managed to, I've, I've actually reviewed books and published uh, scholarly reviews that I have read in less than a day. Uh, does that mean I didn't know what I was talking about? No, I actually did. But once you master this art of getting a book, you can get to know books much, much, much more quickly than by having to slip, sit down and read through every single word. So first step in getting a book is you have to prioritize. There are what you might call books of a lifetime, one-week books, one-day books, one-hour books, ten-minute books. And there are different ways of putting this, but whatever works for you. Books of a lifetime, you read every, well, well, we'll get there in a second. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a second. But you have to decide what kind of book this is and how important it is to your research. Once you've done that, you will scale your reading time uh, and your gutting process to the level of information that you need from that book. And a lot of this has to do, in step two, with understanding the structure of good history books. Now, of course, bear in mind that bad history books, poorly written books, all bets are off. You can do whatever you want with those, <laughs> and you'll have, no, you'll have really no idea what's, uh, what to make of them. But if it's a good history book, uh, there's going to be a, a certain general structure to it. And if that seems odd or uncreative, just remember that the whole point of these books is to communicate. And part of that communication is the structure. And so speaking to people in a language and a structure that they understand is important, which is why uh, you see this more often than not. Uh, books have a central thesis. There is a central idea around which the entire book is focused. And, if, and, and its goal is to prove that idea to you and convince you to accept it. Uh, they're going to have an introduction and a conclusion. The thesis is visited first in the introduction where it's given to you, and then it's nailed back into your skull during the conclusion where hopefully you're going to be convinced I'd have to be a moron to disagree with this author. Uh, every chapter in between points back to that thesis as well. Uh, and every chapter is like a microcosm of the whole book. Each chapter has a thesis. It's got an introduction, uh, an introduction paragraph or, or a section of paragraphs. It's got a body that proves that thesis true. Uh, it also has a conclusion. Uh, and then you can break it down even farther, because if an, an author really knows what they're doing, the paragraphs themselves are like microcosms of the, of the chapters. Each paragraph has a topic sentence that encapsulates the entire point of the paragraph. Uh, and then everything in that paragraph pushes that uh, topic sentence and, let, and backs it up and explains it. You've got transitions, you've got introductions and conclusions. That, they're just A lot of times you miss them because they're so small uh, and, and the, the, that you don't really see them. Well. Anyway, once you've understood that structure, you can leverage it to mine the book for what you need. So uh, let's say you've decided this is a one-week book. This is a book that is very important. It's one of the seminal works on the, to on the topic that you're working on. Well, in this case, read the whole thing. Uh, what I'm offering you here is not a way to get out of reading. If you don't like reading, history is not for you. Uh, but uh, what I'm trying to do is help you read more efficiently so you can read more. So if it's, if it's that important, read everything. Read the, read, read the footnotes. Uh, read, read the dust jacket. Read everything, every, every scrap that you can find in that book. If it's a one-day book, what do you do? Well, read the introduction and the conclusion, and while you're there, figure out specifically what the, what the author's thesis is. Then go through and read the beginning and ending of each chapter, and scan the other pages looking for topic sentences. If you do that, you can go through a book that is hundreds of pages long, and you can walk away with a very strong understanding of what's in that book. If it's a one-hour book, read the intro and conclusion uh, for a, it's his first, it should be fast grip on the author's thesis. Uh, a one-hour review actually would allow you to speak intelligently in this book, uh, on this book, 
uh, even to people who've who've uh, who've read it from cover to cover, because you know what the essence is. A ten-minute book, scan through the intro and find the author's thesis, just so you know where they're coming from. And of course, if it's a lifetime book, devour it, read every word, uh, revisit it every year or so. Uh, there are very few books outside the Bible uh, that uh, you're probably going to uh, to, to rate uh, up on that level. You know, for me. Uh, short of the Bible, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia and uh, the Lord of the Rings are ones that uh, that I do ev- ev- just keep going back to. Uh, and another important point with this is take notes. One of the problems of going through this so quickly is that you're going to tend to forget quite a bit of it. Uh, so as you're going through, jot down those notes. Maybe even write your own little book review real quick so that you can go back and revisit it later and know uh, what all the details are. Now, speaking of book reviews, uh, I wanted to spend just a few minutes and talk about the differences between a standard essay and a book review. Because I find that this is one of the naughtiest points uh, for people all the way on up into the upper levels. There is a difference between a standard essay and a book review because a standard essay, it tells the story of history. So it goes through and it recounts what people did and where they went and why these things are important and so on and so forth. You get the idea. Uh, It's history. This is what happened. A book review does not necessarily tell the history. Uh, Yes, the book review is going to summarize a little bit, but the focus of the book review is not to retell history. It's to analyze and critique someone else's specific storytelling. So the first one focuses on the events themselves. You go out and write a uh, write a, uh, a paper on George Washington at Valley Forge, I'm going to want you to tell me all the details of George Washington at Valley Forge, what he did, where he went. I want you to bring in all of those sources that show us what occurred. A book review on a book about Valley Forge goes and talks about who the author is. It talks about how the author's evidence and how the author used it. Did the author use it effectively? Is the book readable? Uh, Is the evidence strong? Um, Are there any logical fallacies or holes? Is there any reason, would you recommend this book? Those are the kinds of things that a book review will do. So the difference between a book report and a book review is that a book report just repeats what a book says. Uh, it's all summary. So in a book report, you go back and you, uh, you read the book and you, su- you boil it all down and you say, this is what this book says. The reason why you write book reports, especially in the sixth or seventh grade, uh, is because your teachers are trying to prove, what they want you to prove to them that you read it. So if you can boil all of this down and you can repeat the information back to me, then at least in theory it's in your head. Well, a book review will summarize a book, but it takes it a step farther in that it analyzes and critiques it, and the summary is only a moderately small part of what a book review will be. So what's the use of evidence? What's the prose style? Is the, are the arguments convincing? Is, is there a biased interpretation? Would you recommend this book? Those are the kinds of things that a book review uh, will do. And in a nutshell, um, there is some variation, but what what would a book review look like? Book reviews are usually pretty short, uh, unless uh, prescribed otherwise, usually maybe a page single spaced, so two or three pages uh, double spaced at most. Uh, You start off with uh, an introduction to the topic. You say what this book is about. You say who the author is. You usually give uh, some kind of quick critique, uh, not critique, but statement of, of where the author is from uh, and what the author's background is. You then will give about a, a short paragraph of summary of the author's thesis. And you will also, in that section there, uh, you will say what your thesis about the book is. 
So it's not good enough at that point to just simply stop with, this is what the author says. Okay, wonderful. Well, this is what the author says, but what do you say about the author? Is this a good book? Is this a bad book? Is this an, a, a book that's going to change the way you look at the world? Uh, should you just throw it in the trash? You don't have to go into a lot of detail, but just give us a sense for this is how we're going to proceed. Then you give that you give that summary. Then you move into a section. The summary, I would say, by the way, is less than a third of the entire book review. Uh, just enough to where people will know what you're talking about without having having to read the book themselves. Then you go into a section of uh, of analysis. Uh, you talk about all those questions there and maybe some more. And then finally, you sum it all up with a final recommendation. You know, read this book or not. And so the events do appear, but they're not, it's not just summary. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. And historiography papers. Uh, this is something uh, that 401, of course, is always curious about. Um, and I don't blame you, uh, given, given, given what's coming. Uh, a hi historiography is a little bit discombobulating for a similar reason to why book reviews are also discombobulating. Because you're not talking about the events themselves. Historiography is the study of the study of history. And if that sounds confusing, you're not, you're not alone. It is confusing to many people the first few times you deal with it. Uh, and the goal, as we said, is similar to that of a book review. So a traditional history paper tells the story of historical actors and events. A historiography paper tells the story of the historians who were writing about those people and events. Now, here's the big difference between this and a book review. A book review is focused on a single, solitary book. And so you, you analyze that one book, and you find out what this one book says. Historiography papers take a broad swath of various historians who have talked about this topic, and they analyze and categorize and order them to try to show how the debate on this topic has evolved over time. So there are two basic types and approaches that you're liable to run into over the course uh, of your historical career. Uh, one is to f focuses on the history of historical methods. That's one sense of historiography. So the, the Greeks wrote their history different from the Romans. The Greeks were very interested in, just, in this, this pursuit of abstract truth and trying to find final answers and whatnot, whereas the Romans, for example, were all about promoting the Roman state. And everything they said was supposed to make the state look good or push the state on into, uh, uh, into greater glory. And so that, what, what, what I just did right there was give a very, very brief historiographical explanation. Uh, of the Greeks and the Romans. You can move that on into uh, the Reformation, and you can move it into the Enlightenment, into the modern period, postmodernism uh, versus the objectivism. So it's the study of historical methods, how historians actually pursued history. Um, you're probably not going to deal with that much unless you're in an actual historiography class. But the second type is much more common, and this is what you're doing in 401. Uh, it's the history of a specific historical discussion, usually in order to educate yourself on where your work is going to fit in. Now, of course, history is a discussion, and it is in a continuing discussion over the course of many years, and many, many, many different voices and many, many different ideas are all out there playing back and forth, and as a student of history, as someone who is going into the field, just showing up and shouting your ideas at people is not going to necessarily get you very far. You've got to figure out what is different about what I want to say than what someone else said. And how does what I say here contrast with what someone else said over there? And how do you balance these two? Um, you know, so me saying this here, uh, why is this significant? Uh, where can I add to, to, to this discussion? Uh, and so doing a historiography paper, which is what you're doing in 401, 
helps you figure out exactly where you're, you are going to fit. Uh, it also helps you dis discover maybe if your particular topic fits anywhere at all. Uh, because it is entirely possible, and I have seen it happen, somebody goes off and chooses a topic that once they get into the historiography, they find out this is a topic that's been beat to death. There's really nothing left to say about this. And of course, uh, as I think I said in some of our, uh, so, some of our feedback, um, if you just want to get the paper out of the way, then, then that's maybe not a bad thing. But if you're trying to make a career out of this, you really need to know where you can find a topic that will push the envelope of historical knowledge forward and get the attention uh, that, that you really want to have. So of this type of historical uh, discussion, a uh, histori historiography paper, uh, there are two subtypes. The first one uh, examines and broadly classifies large, a large swath of books and articles. And so 30 or more is not too many. I've written papers like this at one point or another that might have 40 or 50 books. I can tell you that's when you start gutting. Uh, so you, you, you'd look at something like the history of African chattel slavery. There have been hundreds of books written on that topic. So when you're trying to figure out how you might be able to say something different or how this discussion has uh, uh, has evolved, you're not going to be able to go back in, and in a, even in a 30-page paper, you're not going to be able to go back and talk about every single one of these books in, in any kind of detail. So what you do is you find the key historians. Historians tend to group themselves around uh, other historians who have big ideas. You know, so for example, Marx comes along, and Marx sadly was a historian, or at least he tried to be. Uh, and so he has a historical thesis, and this historical thesis is that everything boils down to class conflict over economics. Well, for the next 150 years, little historians sort of scurry out from under his umbrella, under his aegis, and they all apply Marxist history. So from then on, they've got his idea as applied to this, and his idea as applied to that, and his idea applied to the other. So you don't have to talk about all of those books. You just talk about the Marxist historians. And you compare the Marxist historians, perhaps, with the relativist historians who come along in the 1930s, people like Charles Beard. Uh, and then you show eventually how they were discredited and replaced by such and such. Uh, so you group the books according to theme or idea, and you place them in this overall hierarchy and story. So you talk about how one group came along first, and they had this idea, and then another group critiqued the first group. And these historians, and you can usually list them in the footnotes, even though you don't necessarily have to talk about them individually uh, in the paper. You, you, you show, this is one of the things, by the way, that it really can Drive, drive historians mad. If you put something in your paper about people say this or many historians think that, they're going to want to see a footnote that has more than one historian in it showing that this is what they think. So when you say many historians of this particular school thought this, you put a footnote with five or ten or however many you were able to find. Um, the second type, and this is what I think you're really doing in, in uh, 401, examines a smaller number of important books and articles, and it deals with them more intently. So instead of making this huge swath and talking about these giant moves of history, you find, let's say, the five most important books and articles uh, of your a particular topic, and you show, you explain them in some detail, and you show how they all relate to each other, and how they served as corrective or furthered the argument or uh, whatever you needed to do, whatever you need to do. Uh, and to a certain extent, these types of historiography papers are like, almost like book reviews strung together on a common theme. Uh, but anyway, the, the same, you have the same idea with both, is to actually study the historians themselves who put this together. Uh, and so five or fewer uh, is normal. Well, to finish up, 
I'd, I'd like to just share some writing tips that I've had at, uh, that I've found on, uh, over the years of my uh, teaching college history. Uh, and all I can say with these is that for some of these that you look at and you go, wait a minute, what person would do that? Just remember that there's been more than one person who has justified me saying these things. Uh, and, and that's kind of true in, in general. If you come across something in a, in a professor's syllabus and you're like, that's crazy. Why would anybody do that? Just bear in mind that there's at least one person out there who actually has tried it and uh, it kind of justifies the addition. So first, and this is really simple, follow the directions. Uh, what comes across when you ignore directions isn't positive. Um, if you have an assignment that says you need to do this in, let's say, in Turabian format, and you turn it in in MLA, uh, well, that means that either you have completely ignored the, d the directions, uh, meaning that you have made a willful decision not to follow the requirements for the assignment. That does not reflect well on you. Or it means that uh, you, you're just completely clueless, that you haven't done the work that you need to do in order to know what you're supposed to do. Uh, and in either case, it's not positive. So when, when, when someone, whether it's a professor or whether it's uh, a, a, a job uh, someone on a job application, when they see that you've missed something like this for really obvious, and it's really obvious that, that, that broadcast to them that you either don't care or that you do care and you, you, you simply have not done your work. So of, of, of all the reasons that you should have, that all the points that you can avoid uh, losing, uh, losing points for, for not following the directions is, has got to be one of the more ridiculous. So please go back and check, go back uh, and make sure that you're doing what you need to do. Uh, and for what it's worth, even if you yourself just make an honest mistake, we all do, it happens to the best of us, um, a lot of people do not make honest mistakes. A lot of people really do uh, uh, just ignore things that they don't feel like they should have to do. Uh, and so uh, when you do it too, even if it is an honest mistake, Sadly, there are enough of the other group that sometimes their reputation can rub off on you. So please, just make sure you do it, uh, you hit those points. Next, I would say think of your audience. Uh, when you're trying to figure out how you should sound in a paper, that can be kind of tough. Uh, because, you know, you're writing for a, in, in this case, uh, a professor who in theory knows as much or more about this topic as you do. Now, well, I'll tell you, especially in some of these 401 papers, to be perfectly honest, by the time you get done with it, you're going to be the expert. There are some topics that are going to be dealt with in 401 that I've just never had the chance to study in detail, and certainly not the detail that you're going to be, you're going to uh, have accomplished by the end of these 16 weeks, uh, once we add 497, 497 into it, too. And so, uh, you will be the expert. But... Regardless, uh, there's, a there's a tendency to stop and think, well, should I have to explain this because this person is an expert? Or is this something that should be included or not? Well, the best thing I can say if you're running into questions like that is try to imagine that you're talking to an intelligent audience not familiar with your topic. Imagine you're sitting down with a good friend uh, over coffee and that this good friend is someone uh, who is very, is very intelligent. You trust their judgment, but they have not had a chance to study this particular topic. And if you would have to explain something to them in order to understand where you were going, uh, then probably you need to explain it in your paper. So don't just assume that everyone knows it. Explain. Because uh, the fact is, if you don't say it, the person reading the paper can't assume that you know it. Um, and again, I can say as a professor, um, I look at some papers and I, and, I have to, and I have to say that I think this person probably knows this, but how can I tell? And so I, since I can't, I have to grade based on what I see. Uh, writing a clear title 
with, with which your audience can engage is a really good way to start that. First, a, clear, a good, clear, exciting, interesting title catches your reader's opinion. They say, why in the world would I need to catch uh, a reader's opinion if this is an, a, an academic paper for a class? Well, it actually has some pretty positive effects. Uh, first, uh, especially if you're thinking about this for, uh, like, say, a grad school application paper, professors read the same papers over and over and over and over again. Uh, same papers on the same topics, uh, rehashed again and again. If you can write something that catches their attention and actually makes them look forward to turning the page and seeing what's beyond your title page, you've already, I don't want to say won half the battle, but you've already made serious headway. And having that clear title is very important, too, from a structural standpoint, because your title should point directly to your thesis. If your title does not point to your thesis, uh, and, and then therefore if it becomes difficult to find your thesis, then people are going to start losing their way through your paper and they're going to be, it's going to be almost impossible for them to, uh, to, to decipher what you're talking about. And the real danger with that, and that's what I'm about to get into with uh, organization too, is that if people can't figure out what your specific point is, they have a tendency, even subconsciously, to make up a point to fill in the gaps. And while you have a reasonable chance to prove the point you're trying to make using the evidence that you have researched, there is an almost 0% chance that you will be able to anticipate every possible imaginary thesis that every conceivable reader could come up with for your paper. So that title should point to your thesis. Your thesis is going to be, as it says a little bit lower down, it's the key to the whole thing. It's your chance to control the debate, control the discussion, and really bring your reader along. And so that does get into that organization. Basic structure matters. Your introduction paragraph, uh, and if you're writing the longer thesis, maybe you can you could do an, an introduction section, but most papers generally stick to an introduction paragraph. The thesis statement comes as the last sentence of that paragraph. Uh, again, placing it there is very important because it becomes the key that unlocks the door for the rest of your paper. And people look for it in that position. Then body paragraphs follow your thesis. Each body paragraph has its own topic sentence that points back to the thesis and proves it true. Uh, and then finally, you have a separate conclusion that draws all of the threads that you've woven back together and drives the point home. Uh, I, I would say, think of your conclusion like the, uh, the arrowhead on an arrow. Uh, it's, what, it, it's what holds all of the force of the bow and the shaft. Everything is focused down onto that one point that's your thesis statement reiterated in your conclusion paragraph so that when people walk away from that conclusion, they didn't have to feel like they were idiots to disagree with your thesis. And so much of that gets, it gets down into organization. And as much as I hate to say it, and I don't think I say it later, so I'll mention it here. Uh, in terms of organization, uh, that's it, I see where I said it, outline. I know people hate writing outlines. There's a part of me that hates writing outlines, too. Uh, but uh, I've never come across a paper that was written well without an outline. And you know, if you're thinking, wait a minute, I write without outlines, and I've gotten A's. Well, uh, I would humbly submit to you that you probably have written it with an outline. You just haven't put the outline on paper. If you have a well-organized paper, you have an outline. It may be in your head as opposed to it sitting on the, on the page in front of you. Uh, but you've got an outline. And so going ahead and putting that on paper, get putting it out, if, if it's just on your computer screen, so where you can actually see these points and how they're arranged and how they relate to each other, that can make a big difference in uh, catching problems with your organization and also making sure that one idea flows intelligently into the next. Uh, and related to that, know the difference between a topic and a thesis. Uh, a, a topic 
uh, is what the paper is about. It is not, and I guess you have to say a thesis is actionable intelligence. You can do something with a thesis statement. You can prove it right. You can prove it wrong. You can walk away saying, yes, I agree with this, or no, I disagree with this. Topics? Yeah. yeah. How do you disagree with it? Like the topic sentence I have here. This paper will talk about George Washington as president. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what's your point? Uh, what are you going to tell me about George Washington as president? Um, if you're, you're going to prove that this paper is about George Washington as president, congratulations, you've done it. Now what? Yeah. You compare that to an actual thesis statement, which puts forward an argument. So a potential thesis for uh, that type of paper might be, George Washington set key precedents during his time in office that shaped the future of America. Now that's something I can, I, can sit, look, I can sink my teeth into, and I can look at it and I can say, okay, yes or no. Either George Washington did set key precedents, and we can identify what they are, uh, or he did not. And so a thesis statement actually gives you something to hang your hat on, and it's very, very important to, make the, make, to, do, the, to do the difference between the two. Um, could you use a topic in your paper? Absolutely. It can go earlier in the introduction, but it is not a replacement for a thesis statement. And to be perfectly honest, by this level, you really should be getting away from the this paper will talk about type constructions. Yes, every once in a while, you'll have a professor who likes that. It is very, very slap you in the face obvious. But it also tends, in my opinion, to be uh, the kind of crutch that weaker writers tend to rely on. And I really would encourage you, uh, if, you're st if you're tempted to do that, to start moving beyond it. There are ways you can obviously show in the beginning of your introduction that this is a paper about George Washington without having to use that sentence. Um, and then, of course, culminate in your strong thesis. Keep your tone objective and professional. Um, when you're writing a paper for a college class, especially a senior thesis, it needs to be in formal professional prose. Uh, formal English, specifically formal English for history, has some very definite requirements. Um, and they're there for a reason. One of the big reasons is, is that this isn't a paper about you. It's not a paper about me. It's a paper about proof. It's a paper about evidence. Uh, when you really get down to it, nobody cares about your opinion. Nobody cares about my opinion. And then that's exactly as it should be. Uh, you know, I've never taught a class on African history. So if I were to suddenly write a book or a paper about African history without doing any research, why would people care? And, and again, they shouldn't care. But they care about your evidence. And the formal style keeps the focus on the evidence and on the proof and off of the author and off of uh, prose styles that tend to be more flowery. So some of those basic things with, prof with professional tone, no first person, so no I or we in historical writing. Yes, I know scientific writing can be different. Yes, I know some professors disagree. I disagree with those professors uh, respectfully because nothing in your paper first is true because you say it. And therefore, saying I think this doesn't actually prove anything other than that you think it. And then secondly, it doesn't give us any information that we don't already know. When somebody says, I think, or in my opinion, or we believe this, then what they're doing is assigning ownership to that specific idea. Well, you assigned ownership to that idea when you put your name on the front of the flipping paper. <laughs> so I don't need someone to tell me again and again to keep telling me, talking to me about themselves and about this is their idea and that's, their, that's the other idea. I'm going to assume everything in that paper belongs to the author if, unless the author specifically shows me through a citation and quotation marks that it belongs to someone else. Uh, so when you really get down to it, using the first person doesn't add anything to your paper. And in fact, it can take away quite a bit. Uh, no contractions. 
uh, informal prose, contractions are things like email. Uh, no dictating to the reader, that's another big one. Let your evidence do the talking. So uh, when, you, when you come across people who say, when one uh, examines the evidence, one will see, or according to the evidence, it becomes clear that those are different ways of basically telling the reader that the reader is too stupid to come to this conclusion without help. And when you do that, many readers are actually put off, and they're much more likely to disagree with you than they otherwise would have been. Uh, so treat your reader with respect and present your evidence, show where your uh, line of reasoning went, and leave them to come to the same conclusion. And it's also just, it's just way, way, way more effective uh, because people who convince themselves of an idea are ten times more convinced than when they're told you have to take this, uh, you, ha you have to take this for granted because I said so. Uh, another small one, no first names after introductions. This is one that I say is small, but you really see it a lot, and it gets really, really repetitive. So after you've introduced George Washington, you don't keep saying George, 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 George Washington, George of the Jungle, George whoever. You simply move to Washington. Uh, and, you, and you don't do it for two reasons. One is that it's very informal. So especially, and some people do this, they, they, they say, instead of saying Washington, they simply say George. So George did this, or George did that. Uh, well, you know, I'm glad that that person might be on a first name basis with George Washington, but I'm not. Uh, and so it, it, it implies a level of familiarity with who you're talking about that, unless I'm greatly mistaken, none of us is going to be able to, uh, to actually legitimately enjoy. Uh, and then second, it just gets to be really, really repetitive. One of the things that makes a good that, show, that that helps distinguish good prose from poor prose is the fact that uh, you have a variety of terms and a variety of uh, uh, of words and names employed. That's why this. That's why this uh, the thesaurus is your friend. Uh, and anything that you that you repeat again and again and again and again is going to tend to detract from your effectiveness. It's bad enough that you've got to keep using the person's name. You need to find other ways to say it, too. You might say the president or the general or whatever for Washington. Uh, but adding that extra George in there uh, just makes it ten times worse. Um, it also, again, makes it kind of sound like you think the reader is going to forget his first name, so you just have to keep repeating it ad infinitum. Um, there is one quick uh, exception to that, uh, by the way. If you're dealing in a, in a place where there's more than one person with the same last name, uh, and therefore there could be confusion, then yes, you can use first names. So we're talking about George Washington in our examples. So you get to the point where you're talking about his home life, and you talk about George and Martha. That's OK, because you can't just say, well, Washington said to Washington that Washington ought to go to Washington. And yeah, uh, that doesn't make sense. So you can use George, you can use Martha, but then as soon as you can, you get back to talking uh, more regular formal style. Uh, another one uh, that, that uh, is a big one, especially in the lower levels, is don't over-rely on the textbook. Textbooks are generally wonderful things. Well, I, I say that, but... Most of the time, textbooks, in my experience, they're not designed to be read. They're designed to be inflicted upon students. Uh, and the, the people who write them write them from the very beginning with the idea that no one would read this book of their own volition. So I've got to try to trick you into, re into reading this book. But regardless, if you're doing a research project in a class, um, yes, using the textbook technically works. I mean, if, I, if you're in my class and I assigned you a textbook to read, I obviously think it's worthwhile. But at the same time, it doesn't really speak very well of your effort or depth of research if I give you a book and I give you an assignment and then say, go out and do research, and all you do is turn around and give me the same book back. Uh, that, 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 yeah, you'll, pro you'll probably pass the, the, the paper, but 
I am not going to be as impressed with a book or with a paper that's that's based largely on the textbook as I am with somebody who's obviously gone out and done original research of their own. Uh, so, um, yes, you can use the textbook if you need to, but don't over-rely on it. The same thing, by the way, will happen sometimes in 401 when you get people who uh, will go through and uh, they'll use uh, they'll use all of their textbooks from all of their career as the sources of their paper, uh, which again, it technically works, but it's not going to be the kind of thing that impresses, uh, and it certainly won't, be impre won't, won't impress people who are looking for publications uh, or are thinking about letting you into their graduate program. Uh, finally, well, second, second to finally, uh, fully integrate your sources into your paper. And, and I say this because, again, I see it happening again and again and again. You have to actually deploy your sources for them to take on meaning. Uh, I grade some papers that have a list of sources at the end and not a single footnote or parenthetical reference in the entire paper. Um, or you might read somebody who's got a bibliography of 10 books, but then they use only two in the paper. Uh, well, when, when that happens, if you don't actually use your research and show where it's applicable, it really just becomes a list of books that you may or may not have read. Uh, and I know people who, uh, I went, went to grad school with people who would actually do that. They'd fill their bibliography book, uh, up with books they'd never read and, and not cite them at all because they were just trying to look more impressive. Uh, so what you want to do is really show where all of these sources, all of this research that you've done, is in, with, and under the paper uh, to, to attack Martin Luther, I suppose. Uh, you want to show that all of, this, all of these ideas, yes, this is your original thought, yes, this is your strong research, uh, but it's not just your research, it's not just your ideas, it's not just your thought, it's got the weight of all of this scholarship behind it. Uh, so. It's not impossible uh, in a, uh, in a uh, senior thesis to have uh, 50, 75, 100 footnotes by the time the paper is over. I've seen that done, uh, and, it, and it can work. Uh, even, even shorter papers, um, using, as, uh, using mi as many sources as you can. If you, and to be honest, probably 100 is too many, but it's not necessarily, uh, mainly because it takes up so much space on the page. Uh, you can you can also combine notes into a single footnote. So at the end of a paragraph, instead of just leaving it and letting people assume somewhere in this giant stack of books I've referenced in the back of the paper as the information that's connected to this paragraph, you can give a footnote. You can give a citation that shows research. Uh, so at the end of the paragraph, you you give specific references to all of the places in say five or six different books that support what you're saying in this paragraph. Um, so use it to demonstrate your research, not just follow quotes. Of course, every time you give a quote, it must be followed immediately by a citation. But don't feel like you have to give a quote in order to use citations. Use citations to show and demonstrate all the hard work you've done. And, and to be honest, I really hope it's something that uh, is good for you, too, that you enjoy. Because if you've gone out and you've done all of this hard work, you should get credit for it. You should be able, you should be able to show people uh, where you've succeeded and why all of this stuff that you've, uh, that you've accumulated really, really matters. Uh, and so show your research. Don't just let it sit uh, in, in the bibliography. And then finally, edit carefully. And this is one uh, yeah, aimed at... at, at, at I see this more in the lower in the lower levels, but I also see it in some of the upper levels too. Uh, you want to make sure that your paper has as few obvious mistakes in it as possible. Now, again, I understand completely. I make mistakes myself all the time, uh, so I am not trying to say that you have to turn in a perfect paper, or it's going to be an awful paper. There are going to be mistakes, but there comes a point where it becomes clear that the sheer number of mistakes that are being committed uh, show not just honest accidents, but faulty craftsmanship, uh, a lack of attention, if you will. Uh, you know, 
you, when you when you go through and and I always make, uh, generally make sure to open all of the papers that I that I grade in Microsoft Word so I can actually do a full spell check and grammar check on it and just see if it calls out anything that uh, that I might miss. Uh, if I open someone's paper and the paper is full of spelling errors that Word is calling out, you know, so it, it's got the little red squiggly line under it and you didn't change it. Um, that really does not speak well, uh, and I'm, you know, that obviously is, go is going to count against you in a pretty serious way. Uh, so you want to avoid that. So first, make sure that you go through and hit all of those obvious errors. Make sure that, you, that you've used the proper citation format uh, and that it is clear that you're actually trying to do it right. Um, and then I would say, of course, take it a step farther. Don't just rely on spell check. Spell check is a wonderful tool, but spell check, uh, especially things with things like autocorrect, we know that it uh, sometimes causes more trouble than uh, th than it fixes. Spell check might change a word that is spelled correctly that it doesn't recognize into something that uh, something that uh, uh, is spelled correctly, but does not belong in that particular position. So the 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 the, the word two t o o versus two t o versus two the number t w o, all of those can be mixed up by spell check. One of my favorite ones was a a, a friend told me about a um, I think it was I don't remember if it was a Sunday school lesson or a paper he was writing for class, but um, the he did an automatic spell check on it. It was it was on David and Bathsheba. Uh, spell check changed it to David and bathtub throughout the whole paper. Uh, so make sure that yes, you hit all those basics, but then you go through and give it the extra the extra time. And really, the only way you can do that is to make sure you finish your project with enough time to be able to walk away from it. One of the biggest things that I run into. And I say this, I run into because this is what happens to me when I make mistakes uh, that I go back and I kick myself on. I'm reminded of uh, one day uh, in graduate school, I, I turned in a paper that had an obvious spelling error in the very first line. And what I, what I had done was I had waited until, the, not literally the last minute, but I did not have time to disconnect myself from what I was working on in order to, uh, to to let my mind refresh itself. And so when I was reading that first line, I was reading what I wanted it to say, not what it actually said. So one of the first things you can do when it comes to editing is when you're done with your paper, set it down, walk away, and do something completely different. Uh, maybe, even for a, maybe even for 24 hours. Go, just go away and don't think about your paper. Do, do anything else. Go engage in a hobby, go watch a movie, do something not related to what you're doing. And that way, when you come back, your brain will have had a chance to sort of refresh its screen. And when you're reading what you're reading there, it'll be more, li more like reading new text as opposed to reading what you expect to see. Another thing you can do with editing uh, is try to is get, a, get a, a, a friend to read it for you. They'll see things. You have to get an honest friend, of course. Uh, the uh, the friends who are just going to go, oh, I love this paper. It's so wonderful. You're a great writer. They're not doing you any favors, especially if it turns out that you're not that great of a writer and that uh, your professor had, uh, they, they, that your friend missed errors that your professor caught. Uh, but a friend who will be honest with you uh, can go back and read it, and they can see things that. Uh, that, that, that you did not see, and they'll be able to call out places that don't make sense to them. And then finally, one other thing I would suggest on that is print out your paper, uh, especially uh, a senior thesis. Print out the paper and actually read it on the page. I don't know what it is about, about screens, but screens have a serious problem Oh, we have a serious problem when we see text on the screen to scan it. And when we scan it, 
we miss a lot of the content inside it that uh, a closer reading would uh, w would identify. Uh, and, you know, you get a giant email from someone that's three pages long, it takes you ten seconds to read it. Why? Because you're not actually reading it, you're scanning it. And there could be ten different spelling errors. Uh, I, I, I get embarrassed by that all the time. I'll write a long email to a student or to a colleague, and I'll look through it real quick, and I'll send it off, and then when they reply, I look on the, I look, I look at, at their reply, and there's a spelling error in what I sent them right in the middle. Why? Because I scanned the page. I did not actually read it carefully. If you look at it on an actual physical page, you tend to see better what's there as opposed to, uh, to what you want to see. All right. Well, anyway, uh, thank you for joining me. I'm going to pause this recording, and uh, we can see if you have any questions.